Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Casper Melville. I'm the convener of the Global Creative and Cultural Industries MA at SOAS. It'd be great to be to see you. So if you could turn your cameras on, I'd love to just um, see your face and um, have you say hello, really. Um, who's that? Joanna. Hi, Joanna, Nina. Hi. Good morning. Um, do you want to just before we start, just tell just just introduce yourself. Tell me where you're you're logging in from. Joanna, where where are you? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just changing my camera. That's okay. Um, I see. You've got two angles. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I'm in London. In London. Okay, great. Uh, nice to see you. And Nina, where are you? Oh, your mic doesn't work. Okay, fine. Um, let me just see what you've said because. Um... Oh, you're in Amsterdam. Oh, lovely. Okay. Um, no, no problem. But it's great to see your face. So. Um, I'll just get started. I mean, we may be joined by a few others. And just to let you know, this is one of several events that we're doing, some in face-to-face, -face, some online. Um, so this isn't necessarily an indication of how many people you'll be in a class with, um, because people are spread all over the place and come into the process at different times. So I'll just talk to you a little bit about the course. And then um, please do ask me questions. Feel free to post a question in the chat or um, you know, just interrupt me at any point if you've got a particular question. I'll talk for about um, 15 minutes or something, and then uh, we can have a bit of an, a question and answer, and, and I can kind of fill you in about things that you want to know about. Okay? Good. All right. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here so that you can... Um... Okay. Let's see. Let me start. Joanna, can you see that? Yeah, okay. So, uh, MA Global Creative and Cultural Industries, quite a mouthful, I know. So we usually call it GCCI, uh, just to sort of uh, cut things down. So this is really just a question of just to think about what is it and why would you study it and why would you study it so as. Um, so this is just to give you a sort of just a brief outline and it changes every year, but this is, this is the kind of profile of the students from last year. Um, I had 30 students in the class last year. That was actually a pretty big class. I think it, uh, it numbers usually somewhere between 15 and 25. Um, there was a bit of a kind of COVID bounce last year because I think people you know, couldn't work and were looking to, for things to do. So generally speaking, I have a very international student body. Uh, people from the UK tend to be the smallest group, uh, not necessarily the smallest national group, but um, they're outnumbered by people from other countries. So as you can see, of the 30 students I had last year, I had students from France, Singapore, Ghana, China, Pakistan, uh, Singapore, I said Singapore, didn't I? Um, uh, Taiwan, Poland. Uh, oftentimes people who come to SOAS are also have interesting cultural backgrounds. So in fact, the person who, who was from Poland was in Poland, but she was half Japanese. Uh, the person from Ghana is a was a UK, a British, uh, African descent. Roughly speaking, the, uh, the sort of age profile tends to be, well, I've put here 20 to 50. That's because I've had some people in the class who are, you know, are, are closer to me in age than you. But I say probably the average is about 27. Um, it's usually people who've done their undergraduate degree and then probably done some work not necessarily in the cultural industries, although a lot of people have done work in the cultural industries as curators or working as musicians or um, working in social media marketing, that kind of stuff. In terms of academic background, because this is a discipline which combines a lot of different perspectives and is a relatively new discipline, people who tend to do this class come from a very wide range of backgrounds. I've just listed some of them here. You can see from literature and you know cultural studies, anthropology, history, fine art, um, you know, maybe practical based courses, a lot of people have come in having done a music degree or, or some kind of production degree or they've been a photographer, that kind of stuff. It really is very varied and it really is fairly immaterial what your first degree is in. Um, you know, different degrees set you up in different ways. So if you've done a you know, philosophy or a kind of humanities degree, you might be a little bit ahead of the game in terms of writing essays. But then if you've had some practical experience of the cultural industries, uh, you can bring that to bear on what, what we're doing. What do people, what do students have in common? I mean, this I'm kind of basing on the statements that people make when they apply. Um, I don't know if you've applied either of you, but you, you know, you have to write a personal statement. And really the issue is, you know, what, what are people looking for in a, in, a, in a course like this? And I think the general issues will be people who, either who 
do work in the creative economy in some way or other. They might be makers of things, you know, artists or cartoonists or photographers or musicians, or they may be people who've worked somewhere in the middle in between the artist and the audience, like a curator or uh, working in music publishing. People who are trying to think more strategically about their own career, get some kind of deeper theoretical understanding of the field that they're working in, try and think about how they can manage their workload and their kind of, you know, aspirations. Uh, you know, working within capitalism, obviously. Uh, and then there's also people who are doing career changes, really, that they, they, you know, they've worked for a while in, you know, I don't know, uh, working for a, some kind of corporate company or for a charity. And they're thinking, well, actually, I've got a passion for some aspects of art and culture. So I'd like to move into that field. So that seems to be the kind of um, common ground. Some people are pursuing an academic career, you know, they're using an MA to kind of upskill, thinking ahead to maybe doing a PhD and being an academic. Um, others are thinking about how they can apply what they learn to a different setting. For example, I've had four people in my class who worked in the British Council. So they work in cultural policy, usually between somewhere between the West and some other part of, of the world. Uh, three of them are in the African unit and one in the, in the Myanmar unit. You can see at the bottom just a list. These are, these are just some of the jobs that the people in my class were, were doing or had done. I mean, some people work while they're doing the class. Uh, we can talk about that if you want. Um, I had a swing dance teacher, someone who managed a funeral home in China, fashion designers. I've had a couple of fashion designers. Some, some people are activists, record label managers, radio presenters, journalists, jazz musicians. So that's the kind of range of people that you'd be likely to be sitting in a class with um, from, a, from across the world with a variety of different interests and backgrounds. Um, this is a question which the government always sort of insists that we address and, uh, you know, because they want to know that our teaching is you know leading people into careers and of course students care about it as well it can be a tricky question to answer i mean in terms of the government statistics it's tricky because the government only cares about jobs which people have in the uk and actually what often happens for my students is they go back to where they're from or somewhere else in the world and they you can't necessarily track them but just as an indicative of some of the things that people have done who've done the course um like i said i've had four i I said three here, but <clears throat> I've got four students who've worked at the British Council. A lot of my students go into kind of event management and promoting events at the South Bank, uh, Somerset House. Uh, one of my former students is running a film company in Angola. Um, my jazz dance student is now running a dance school in, in Taiwan. Uh, one of my students is a curator at the ICA, the in Institute of Contemporary Art. Several are on PhD programs across the world in America or in SOAS, uh, Cambodia. Um, uh, so, yeah, in terms of the course content, so the, the idea of this MA is that it combines theory and practice or theory and skills. We want to make sure you're fully kind of uh, appraised of the theoretical background to the study of the creative industries, various perspectives going all the way from kind of Victorian ideas of high art through kind of mid-century Marxist ideas about mass culture all the way up to the cultural studies of the 1970s and then through into the, into the development of ideas around specifically around the creative economy, which tended to happen at the end of the 90s, early 2000s. So I, do a I teach a core course where we look at all of that theoretical material and um, you write essays or students write essays. Uh, and similarly, there's a class on the, the, the um, global film industry and on the music business which look at those businesses in terms of their structure, but in terms of a wide range of issues, including identity, you know, the content, but also issues around distribution, issues around uh, entrepreneurship and those kind of questions. So, so the, course, the structure of the course means that there are some things you have to do and there are some things that you can choose to do. So what you have to do is a dissertation, everyone does a dissertation, 10,000 words, and that you deliver that in the September, the following September, so your whole, journey at SOAS starts at, in very late September and ends in September. Um, you, uh, so everyone does a dissertation. What you do it on is entirely up to you. We work with you to kind of refine a, uh, an issue that you want to focus on and do research on. You might come into SOAS with a burning question that you want to answer or a set of issues that you want to explore or an area, region that you're interested in, or you might not have any idea and that's fine as well. Lots of people are making up their minds right now you don't have to come up with a title for your dissertation until uh, January of, the, uh, of 2022 for my students who are studying now. So compulsory courses are the core course, which I teach in term one, 
global film industries, which my colleague, L Professor Lindy Way Dovey, who is a, an expert on African film, teaches uh, also in term one. Again, she looks at film both as an aesthetic object and as an industry. And she's got loads of experience and brings lots of interesting filmmakers and, and distributors into the class. And the students make uh, video essays as part of their assignments. So it's quite hands on as well as being theoretical. I teach a class called the music business in term two, which does a similar thing for the music business, thinks about it in a very broad way, not just the big record companies, but, you know, issues around copyright, around identity, around um, different genres and whether genre is a useful kind of way of thinking about music. We look at all kinds of music in that class, um, you know, even including classical music and world music and stuff like that, because all of it is caught up with the same set of questions around the music industry. And obviously, there's a lot of focus in there on digital technology, on the, the ethics of Spotify, uh, you know, the power of the tech giants and how we can kind of address that and work with that and whether musicians can make a living. So those are the compulsory courses. In addition to that, there is a there's a list of uh, guided options from which you choose a certain amount. Now, we've changed it slightly this year and the current page <clears throat> doesn't reflect that change. So. In the past, we asked people to take three modules from the skills uh, se section. I think now we're going to say at least two because to give you a bit more flexibility. But within that list, you've got a podcasting class, which I teach. There is a sound recording class if you're interested in recording music in a studio with a, with a professional uh, producer. There's a class called Curating Cultures where students make their own exhibition. There is a work placement module, which is called Directed Study in Industry, which we can, you can use either to find work placement with, my, with the support of the convener, which would be me, or to develop your own entrepreneurial projects or to do both. So a lot of people have used that class to, well, last year I had two students who set up a magazine. I've had someone who, <clears throat> who ran an online contemporary African art festival. I've had someone who recorded their own album and released it and sort of thought reflexively about the process. It's really the place where you think about the relationship between the theory and <clears throat> things that you're learning and your own career, things that you want to do. You know, some people are using it as a place to kind of write a new business plan for their own business. Sometimes people are using it to think about how they can manage a kind of portfolio working life in the creative economy. And then in addition to, oh, sorry. And then in addition to that, there is, uh, there is a, a bunch of um, optional classes that you can take. Now, there is, there's a list on the so as site of the optional classes that, I'm re that I recommend that go well with this class. So there's a lot of film classes from specific locations, Taiwan, uh, China, um, uh, and various other places. There's also media classes there um, and history of art classes there. Now there, there is the scope to take open options, they're called within SOAS from other departments. And there is a list available. There will be a list available of those. So you've got quite a, a lot of choice. And the main anxiety and the main difficulty that most SOA students seem to have when they arrive is narrowing down their options because there's so much. And so much of it looks interesting and exciting. So um, bear that in mind. You can't do everything. There are, there are reasons why you can't do everything. Some, to, some of them to do with the structure of the course, which only allows you a certain flexibility. Some is to do with timetabling. Two of the classes you want to do might be simultaneous and you can't do both. Um, but there is a lot of options. There is a lot of choice. You'll be asked to make some decisions when you first arrive or before you arrive at SOAS, but you can, you get a couple of weeks at the beginning of term to tweak those if you end up that you go to the first lecture and you don't really like it or it doesn't seem right or you've heard about another class that is open. So there's a bit of flexibility there. That flexibility will go away after a while when once you settle on what you're doing. Um, there's a lot of choice. Uh, SOAS is a place which has a great deal of expertise in the regions that we care about, um, you know, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, but also, you know, you, you, you know, there are classes which are about Cuban music. I myself tend to, uh, my research is about Afro-diasporic music, popular music in London. So there's, a, there's an emphasis on diaspora as well um, to go along with those re that regional focus. In addition to the formal classes and the curriculum, I run something called the Centre for Creative Industries, Media and Screen Studies with my colleague, Lindy Way Dovey, which is a kind of research center within the School of Arts. And we really use it as a place to bring in expertise from elsewhere. So we run a seminar series, we have group screenings, debates, that kind of stuff. This is just a, a indicative list of the kind of people that we've had come and talk to our students. Um, 
if Annie was a, actually a student on the course and she's the one who went to be a curator at the ICA, so she came in and gave a talk about how, how she did that and what it was like. Uh, Clive Nwonka, who's now at UCL just next door to us, is an expert on black British film or black film in general, um, and doing a big project with the, the British Film Institute. Kim Marie Spence used to run cultural policy in, for the Jamaican government, but she's now a, a researcher and um, she came in to talk about K-pop. Uh, and the kind of politics and, and economy of K-pop. Jenny Mbai runs the Creative Industries MA at City University, and she came to talk to us about, about her research in Africa. And Oli Mould is a, is a geographer who, who writes about the creative industries and how we need to change our kind of focus from a sort of individualized entrepreneurial idea to a much more community-based problem-solving sense of what creativity is. So that's just a sample. So all of that comes in addition to your classes. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief kind of just a group, just a little sense of the kind of things, and this is really based on the, the core course that I teach, the kinds of things that I cover in the core course and some of the issues that come up. So this first slide is taken from my first lecture, and this is situating the creative economy in, the, in within ideas of the nation and national economy. This is actually taken from the British government's website where they're talking up the creative industries. Some of the, the information on this is a bit out of date. This is 2014, but it gives you a general sense of what's going on. Western governments in post-industrial developed countries like the US, Australia, the UK have used the creative industries or have latched onto the ideas of the creative industries as a replacement for the industrial wealth that they no longer have. You know, there's no more coal, oil, steel, any of those big extractive things. There's no more colonialism or colonialism has moved online. Uh, in some ways um, and so you, here you can see how the government are using the creative economy and the idea of creativity annexed to an idea of kind of the nation building the nation making the nation great creativity is great britain can be great too right and you can hear see the numbers that are being delivered here almost 10 million uh, a day generated by um sorry almost 10 million an hour generated by the UK cultural economy. You probably heard some of this debate going on at the moment about what a great country the UK is in terms of its, its culture. Um, we, we take a critical look at that. Um, in, this, um, in this slide, really, this is just to give you a sense that we also kind of incorporate within the core course discussions about different ways of thinking about culture from high art, high culture. So bottom left there, you've got a Caravaggio um, to more anthropological notions of culture. Top right here is a, a, a ceremony in, in Afghanistan. To the top left here is, um, is a piece of kind of activist art. And so we look at some ideas associated with the idea of art, whether it should be propagandist, what happens when art is kind of put in the service of, pro of, of kind of, um, you know, social justice, you might say. And then bottom right, there is a picture of a pub and that's introducing the idea of that cultural studies started to work on, which is the idea that culture is ordinary. Culture isn't some kind of special thing that only some people have. It's part of, it's, it's our everyday life. It's how we live, it's what we do with our time. It's how we interact with each other with, you know, so that, so that this is a way to situate discussions of culture. Uh, this, um, I'm not gonna, I don't know. I don't, I feel like I shouldn't show you this, but I think this guy, I'll just give you a- Hey bit. guys, how are you doing? I hope you are having, a lovely day wherever you are in the world. I've had the best morning ever throwing a birthday party for my one year old pup. Right, I'm stopping it there. This is what this, this guy, Alfie, I mean, he's not an important person in one sense, but in another sense, he's indicative of something very important that's happened in the creative economy, which is the emergence of influencers, social media influencers. This guy's made a vast amount of money from being pointless online. He, that's the name of his brand, right? So. You can't criticize him for talking about a pug birthday party or doing reaction shots to his friend's Instagram post because he's already told you it's pointless and yet he's built a huge audience and a huge amount of wealth. Last year he was worth three and 3.38 million. Um, sorry, yeah, that's right, last year, the year before that, 2.2. He has got a multimedia platform, he's got a podcast, he's written, he's a best-selling author, believe it or not, with a pointless book. Uh, you might think it's nothing to do with us and it's certainly nothing to do with art and culture, but it actually this introduces a whole series of questions that we do need to deal with. The impact of digital on culture, has it democratised the production of art and culture? Uh, do, what kind of 
content is produced and what about the activity of the audience here, you know, who obviously are part of the process building this audience. So that's where we look at digital. This, this image is just to indicate that there, there is a certain amount of um, kind of theory and some of the theory is Marxist theory from the mid century. So this is just a kind of picture really, which tells you the, the Marxist view of culture. You can see that culture sits on top of the base the base is what really matters in Marxist theory, you know, the relations of production, who owns the means of production, and all of the other things sit on top. Other uh, uh, people, other theorists like Theodore Adorno, Walter Benjamin, and then later cultural studies adapted this model, but made it more sophisticated and, and started to argue that actually ra culture, rather than being some sort of what they call epiphenomenon, something that sits on top of what's really important, is actually the way in which we understand everything, including the economy. So it's actually much more important than traditional Marxist theory might have you believe. So there'll be some introduction into that. You know, I'm not going to try and turn you all into cultural Marxists, but you know, these are, these are really important perspectives to understand. And if you do happen to then become a cultural Marxist, so much the better, you'll piss off the Tory government. Um, this is a picture about, um, this just indicates the cultural studies perspective kind of thing, which is that in the late seventies in the UK, particularly, but also in other places, a very influential way of thinking about culture emerged, which was focused on, not on big industries, you know, not the creative industries, but the way in which people, including marginalized people use culture to make, to build their own lives and express their own identities. This of course is a picture of some punks from the King's Road. Uh, which relates to a book, a very influential book written by someone called Dick Hebdige called Subculture, The Meaning of Style. So I'll introduce you, you may know some of those ideas if you've ever studied cultural studies, but they may be unfamiliar to you, but I will give you a kind of whistle stop tour through some of those ideas and how they still impact on our understanding of culture and the study of culture. This, um, this slide is really, I do quite a lot There's in the midsection of the core course about the impact of digital, the kind of ideology of digital, and the, the implicit claim that digital was going to democratize everything. It was going to put power into the hands of the producers, people like yourselves who can suddenly make their own films and you know, on their phone, uh, go onto YouTube, build a relationship with the audience without having to go through the gatekeepers and the big institutions. This is a counter argument from someone called Jaron Lanier, who was a famous kind of, he coined the term um, artificial intelligence. He used to work for, you know, he's worked for Google and Microsoft. He's a digital guru really. But he uses this example to suggest there's some real problems with the digital. And this is the example of Kodak. You'll know Kodak as the camera makers, the film makers, they're the biggest company in film, you know, for, throughout the 20th century. At the height of its power, as he says here, it employed 140,000 people and it was worth about 28 billion, right? Huge jobs in America, in Germany, jobs which were paying well and were therefore supporting families, right? It goes bust in 2012. There's a very interesting story about why it goes bust because we know, we can imagine why it went bust because of the emergence of the digital camera. But Kodak were well ahead in the development of the digital camera. They were well positioned to shift, to pivot as they call it, to digital, but they didn't have the infrastructure to do it. They didn't have the understanding of it and therefore they failed and went bust. And what happens also in 2012? Instagram, you'll know what Instagram is, was bought by Facebook for a billion pounds, right? dollars actually it was, a billion dollars. And at the time it was bought, it had 13 employees. So you can see what's happened here, something, the capitalization has gone way up, it's all gone digital, but what's happened to the jobs? And this is the big question that Jérôme Lanier is asking. And he's basically saying that the internet has killed the middle-class jobs in the creative economy, right? Think about all those 140,000 people and all the people they're supporting and all the children they're feeding, that's all gone. There may be more than 13 employees now at Instagram, but it's not 140,000. So this is raising some questions that we need to ask about the nature of the digital economy, which I do ask. Again, this is looking at questions of cons uh, consolidation, media ownership, who owns what, what are the basic processes of, of digital? As you can see here, Google, for example, the way it works is that they own, they buy up lots of other companies and use them for research and development. So they own 186 other companies. So there's been huge concentration at the level of ownership, while at the same time, there's been huge diversification in terms of distribution, different channels, you know, no, no longer are we all sitting down to watch the same thing on television, everyone's watching something different. 
This is just a slide to indicate that I also look at questions of kind of politics and the relationship between the creative economy and state power. Here, this is drawn from a piece that I teach about Morocco. I didn't write it, but I, I teach it. And it's just about thinking about the different forces. And this is to encourage us not to impose a kind of Western view entirely on the creative economy. It's different in different places and different forces matter. In the UK, you know, religion doesn't matter a great deal when it comes to thinking about the creative industries, but that's not the case in Morocco. Similarly, the army doesn't have any role to play in the creative economy of the UK, but is hugely influential in Korea. So in terms of how it works in Morocco, you've got different forces at play. You've got the monarchy. It's all Islamic, but different kinds of Islam. The, the monarchy is kind of a, a sort of fairly secularized, uh, modernized view of Islam, but with the king and the king and their, his cronies who run a certain part of the, of the state. But on the other hand, you've got the, the prime minister who is uh, from an Islamist party. So they're kind of modern in one sense, but they're also traditionalist and quite conservative. And then you've got the forces of the kind of the post Arab Spring forces. These are, the, you know, this was the big upheaval, the revolution, which has never quite, um, you know, delivered on its promise, but that has created a kind of civil society element within Morocco. And all of these different forces use culture in different ways. They project a different idea of what they want the nation to be. They show different, they, they have different music, different ways of dressing, different film, different kinds of dance. So you, here you can see the creative industries as a kind of place where political struggle is being fought out at the level of, you know, music festivals, what film is acceptable, what's happening on television. And you can apply the similar kind of model to any, almost any place, you know, obviously China has got a very different model to the US, which has got a very different model to Mali uh, or to Taiwan. This is about thinking through questions of the creative city and some of the consequences of thinking like that. The creative city idea has been a very popular one within uh, creative industries and goes hand in hand with an idea of the so-called creative class, like this new group of people who are working in the creative economy, which you may want to be part of. But this is just to remind you, this slide is to remind you of some of the consequences which are often hidden. So on the le top left, you've got Silicon Valley and you can see where you know Silicon Valley, the center of the digital economy. And of course, that is the place which, where the power over culture now resides and then on the right you've got a place called the jungle which really is a kind of temporary encampment of people who have lost out who haven't prospered in the silicon valley world so there's some there's a lack of fit between the big optimistic promise of digital and creativity on the one hand and then you know poverty and being left out on the other and then at the bottom there's a similar thing you, uh, argument you might make about london down there on the right i don't know where you're sitting in london joanna on that map i'm in South London, probably. Southwest, so. <laughs> Southwest, where, yeah. which bit? I'm in, uh, I'm in Streatham. You're in Streatham. All right, yeah. cool. Well, I'm in West Norwood. In fact, we don't even figure on this map, as you can probably yeah. see. They've decided only North London matters. But, um, but what you can see there is, ha is, is, is the change in house prices that's been happening through gentrification on the one hand, and part of gentrification has been the growth of the creative economy and the big fuss that's made of it. If you think of somewhere like Shoreditch, which built its reputation on creativity and hipster culture and has, you know, consequently house prices have gone up 68%. And then on the left is Grenfell Tower, you know, this, um, the, this um, housing block that, that was insufficiently uh, sort of secured against fire uh, with poor residents living in a very rich area. So the, this is pointing out some of the ironies and some of the kind of critical way in which we need to treat the great celebration that goes on around digital cultures and the creative economy. Um, so here's, this is just an example of kind of some of the perspectives, this person, Toby Miller, who's a kind of critic of the notion of the creative economy. So there's a critical edge to all of this, you know, it's not just about, it's not about training you, you know, it's not a training course and how to work more efficiently within the creative economy necessarily, or uh, or a kind of upskilling to make you the super employee, although you'll get lots of that. It's also to give you a critical understanding of some of the core issues about justice, about uh, ownership and structure, and how you might be able to work, you know, thinking about your own position in relation to these kind of questions. And I, I mentioned to you earlier on about Ollie Mould. So Ollie Mould's book, which I really like, which is called Against Creativity, very much a critique of a certain kind of ideological idea about what creativity is and very much proposing that we need to shift and there's been a big shift in the creative industries literature recently which has moved towards thinking about how can the creative economy be sustainable 
how can it be you know environmentally um you know uh, not wasteful how could it involve more people how could it really be diverse some of those kinds of questions are coming up a lot um which is great uh, and and sort of opens a new space for uh, your own research if you are going to be doing that so i'm going to stop sharing now there's my email there if you want to contact me um so I just want to know, having told you all of that, what, do you have questions? How does it fit with what you're interested in? Joanna, you can, I know you can talk and, and Nina, you can't, but Nina, if you just kind of bash it in the chat, if you've got questions, um, anything, anything, and I'll, I'll try and, how did that look to you, Joanna? Yeah, I had a question. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, maybe I'll be honest as well, how I got here. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, so I signed up for the open day yesterday as I was looking quite like a few courses on kind of climate change, sustainability. Um, and then I saw that and literally five minutes before I was like, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> um, because my background is, so I, I graduated um, from my undergrad almost five years ago. Um, I did economic economics and statistics <laughs> um, at St Andrews um, but I now have worked almost five years um, at a very large tech company um, on kind of media side so services like streaming music and uh, and uh, TV um, because music has always been a, a, a kind of big part of my life and passion of mine so yeah, this sounds really interesting, but I guess my question is, because I've always considered myself quite a numbersy person, and I think you mentioned um, that there are a few people who have um, come from that background and mm -hmm. obviously getting used to writing essays. Um, I think that was the part that kind of got my heart racing a bit because whenever someone's like, I need to write a lot of essays. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me just, get, okay, thank you. For that's very interesting what you've said. And just to say, just to connect to what your earlier interest, as I just said at the end, there is now this movement within the creative industries to understand it as, you know, an, an economy, an economy which has some responsibility to the to the world. You know, I mean, I don't know if you've picked up this discussion about NFTs, for example, you know, non-fungible tokens, the big thing in art, everyone's so excited. And then it's like, <clears throat> By the way, do you know how expensive on the environment it is to run this stuff, to mine cryptocurrency? And it's like, come on, are you serious that that's going to be the way forward? So while there isn't a great deal of sort of teaching about that kind of embedded into this class in the sense that it's, it's a relatively new field, I get to it in the, in, in the course of um, my core course, but we don't have a kind of creative industry and the environment module, let's say, it is a very... It's a new area, it's just opening up. There's a lot of good work in that space. And it's the sort of thing that you could pursue through your own dissertation and the kinds of things you wanted to write about, whether or not you're formally getting taught that, that issue. Mm -hmm. That's one thing to say. The other thing to say is the open options thing it's, would allow potentially the possibility of taking a class in uh, development or you know, if you wanted to sort of back it up with some environmental stuff. But on the essay writing thing, I, people who come to this class come with a very wide range of skills from being very good essay writers to being not very good essay writers and actually tend to cluster more to the not very good side. And the reason being that a lot of people are working not in their first language. A lot of people haven't been in ac British academia. A lot of people haven't been in any kind of formal humanities academia. Like you said, they may be a numbers person or they might be more of a creative, you know, a sort of musician. So I'm very used to working with people who are at lots of different levels. Now, I'm a former music journalist and magazine editor. I'm very keen on teaching the skills of writing good English, but I'm not necessarily expecting people to have them at the start. So things are, so for example, in my core course, I set two assignments. The first one is a thousand word essay and the second one is a 2000 word essay. The first essay is worth 30%, the second 70%. So the idea is, you do your first essay, you do your best job, I give you a lot of feedback on it, and we try and refine you as a writer as we go. So it's one of the skills that you're learning. In fact, it might be the, the skill that, you know, that most people know least about, but develop while they're here. I'm very keen, all of us are very keen to develop you as, as good academic writers. And that doesn't mean 
writing over complex ways or with very long words. It means, you know, putting together a, a logical argument, supporting it with evidence, you know, those kind mm -hmm. of questions. Um, that being said, not everything you do is essay based. So, you know, in podcasting, obviously, the main issue is, is making a podcast. You keep a diary as well and you submit that and you write a short essay at the end. In the film class, you make a film, a film essay using your phone, whether or not you've ever made one or not. Don't worry. In sound recording, obviously, you're being marked about, you know, mixing levels and mics and stuff like that. So we have a diverse range of assignments. It's not just writing essays. You will end up writing, you know, 20,000 words in addition to your dissertation, 20 or 30,000 words, depending on the course that you do. But it's not something to worry about because it's something the expectations are. It's such a varied group of people with such a varied skill set that, um, you know, that and that's part of the fun. You know, that's one I, I want people to know that they can come in wherever they start. And when they come out at the end, they will be a podcaster. If they do the podcasting class, they will be a, an academic writer because they will have done academic writing. They will have written a 10,000 word dissertation, you know, and it's, it's just another skill, just like any other skill that you can acquire. I mean, I'm terrible at reading spreadsheets, but I've had to uh, acquire some of those skills, you know, when I was running a charity. And it's like you just have to look, go out of your comfort zone and kind of learn how it works. Um, but you'll get a lot of guidance and a lot of help and a lot of support. You know, I, I put a lot of emphasis and so do my colleagues on feedback. You know, we, you, you post your essays online on this kind of uh, bit of software where we can put comments on the page to actually tell you, you know, here you need some more evidence. This isn't very clear. You know, maybe you could have chosen a better word, perhaps if you tried like this. And then I give audio feedback as well. Um, you know, we have office hours. So you know, you definitely can't write as bad an essay as I have seen <laughs> at SOAS, right? But I've also seen people go from writing pretty poor essays to write, doing outstanding work in, within a year. So it's entirely possible. And it's just a, a matter of, tr you know, doing it. And yeah, it, no, I agree. I think it's, it's, uh, it's probably because I just don't, haven't had the practice. Um, but it's practice, yeah. exactly. But this is, this is your practice. This is your, your, um, your chance to do that. I should say something on um, part time and full time. You can do it either part time or full time uh, if you're a UK resident. And my recommendation would be to do it part time if you're able, because, well, there's two reasons. One, you're able to work if you want to. Two, you just got more time to assimilate everything because there's a lot. I'm not saying you can't do it in a year. And for some people that that works very well. But you end up coming in. Uh, you know, doing four classes simultaneously in term one and then another four in term two and then your dissertation, um, you know, so it's quite intense. And the other advantage of doing it in two years is that you get a chance to kind of let it simmer a little bit and to develop your skills a bit more and to be associated with SOAS for longer because there's so much going on at SOAS that you can't do everything, but you'll be able to do more of it if you're two years and one year. It's only a recommendation and that it dif different things suit different people. Um, Nina, that is a good question, and you know, I, I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't know if Laura does. Yep, unfortunately, um, not at the moment, and it's don't all you... just tied into visa sponsorship and regulations yeah. around that. Yeah, I thought so. Now, don't worry. I mean, you know, I'm not telling you it's terrible in one year at all, <laughs> and actually, you know. It's a different kind of feel, especially if you're coming from a different country. It's like you're coming to London and you're absorbing yourself fully within it. You know, a lot of my students who do it part time maintain a full time job or a, a full time ish job um, and which, you know, and they are able to do both. But as a kind of I mean, I did my MA in one year and I found it you know, great and I just completely absorbed myself in it. And, you know, and then it then it works. And in terms of the way the work um, breaks down in a year at SOAS, it's we have three terms, but only two terms are teaching terms. So it's a two very intense chunks of 11 weeks from September, late September to Christmas is one chunk. And then from early January to the, almost the end of March is the other chunk. Then there's a break around Easter time. I don't know what the, I shouldn't really use Christian holidays to sort of describe this, but you know, you know how it goes. And then in term three, uh, there's no classes that you might have some catch up classes, some exams, depending on whether you've done classes which have exams. 
um, if people are doing directed study in industry, this is when they're doing their work placements, often that kind of stuff, and you're starting to develop your dissertation, but you're a little bit freer in your time, you can spend more time go, you know, going to events at SOAS and spending time in London, but also working with your supervisor on your dissertation, which happens over the summer. Uh, yeah, so that's how it all sort of breaks down uh, in terms of sort of timings and, and whatnot. Have you got any more questions? Nina, how did that sound to you? Is it something that you're interested in? I know it's a bit of a leading question. You're not going to say no, are you? <laughs> I wouldn't be offended if you did, but. Okay, good. So I, I've given you my email. Well, cm54 is at soas.ac.uk is my email and it's on the website. Feel free to drop me a line if you've got any other specific questions about stuff. In terms of application, I don't know if you've applied already, but if you haven't, um, don't worry too much about it. The main issue is your statement, really. I mean, as long as you meet the criteria, you know, financially and in terms of your academic background. And like I said, academic background, it doesn't really matter what it's in. And it also doesn't matter that much to me. I must say, you know, if you were like an outstanding A star student or you were, you know, you just did OK, that's not because a lot of people when they first do, they do their first degree, then, you know, they're not quite sure where they're at in life or that it's not a subject they're necessarily going to be good at. Much more important is the statement in terms of why you think this is interesting, how it connects to your own interests, how, you know, how you would like to take this forward, just to get a sense of your personality and what, and, and what you're about, you know, don't, and then it's straightforward. It just comes to, in fact, if you meet the criteria, generally um, it will be straightforward and it, it's only if there's borderline issues that it won't be. Um, and yeah, term starts at the end of um, at the end of September. There's something called Welcome Week, which is the week where you can't usually the last week of September where you have to come and register and kind of everything's very chaotic and you know you don't know where all the classrooms are. And then teaching starts at the beginning of October usually. Uh, so it's um, great. Sorry, go on. Sorry, very quickly on the on the statement. Uh, I think you mentioned it. So when it comes to the kind of dissertation or end of the yeah um, that project, you don't have to kind of in the statement. Um, yeah, not at all. No, I mean if you have you know it, it, it's sufficient to say, for example, for you, you know, I've got an economics background. I'm a numbers person, but I'm interested in arts and creativity, and in particular in issues around sustainability and justice. It's like that. That's yeah. That's perfect, really. Um, you don't have to demonstrate that you're, you know, completely au fait with all the literature, all those kind of things. You know, I'm sort of more more interested in a way to just connect with what you're interested in. You know, your set of interests and the kind of areas that you might, because that gives me some some idea about forward planning, about how to support you and where to who to send you. Because of course, the other thing that SOAS offers is you have potentially have access to everyone at SOAS, you know, it's our job to be available to you. So if there are, there'll be professors who are professors of kind of water in India, or, you know, legal questions around, um, you know, FGM, or, you know, just if, if there are things that interest you, or you want to connect them up, because there's a kind of cultural angle to all of these things. Um, that, you know, that that's there for you as well. So when you're joining SOAS, you're not just, you know, registering for classes, you're joining a community of people who are all invested in you doing great work and you know actually in the end in your dissertation starting to do original research in areas which you know we 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 can't do everything <laughs> we need a new generation of people exploring these questions so yeah okay well it's it's really nice to meet you just like like i said this is not indicative of how many people will be in your class um it because it people come from all over and i never really know who's going to be in the class until the day it starts in all honesty in terms of teaching, just to let you know, at the moment, we're teaching in a blended way, which means it's a variety of things. But for one of, one of my classes, I give online lectures and face to face seminars. We are moving gradually to, to a more face to face in term two. Uh, we're encouraging all students to be around and come into SOAS, but not everything is taught on uh, face to face and actually th there are great advantages to that it was a big learning curve last year with lockdown but there are some things which work really well online something about online lectures which are very got lots of um, content 
which allows you to watch them at your leisure, to rewatch them, to, you know, to, to pause them to, in order to assimilate them, to review them before the final exams and things. So we won't ever give that up, but we, we will strive to, you know, see as much of you as we can, get you together with other students and do events. And, you know, our concert series is running at the moment. We're, you know, we're having a Christmas party. There's, you know, we're starting to move into, we hope, the post-pandemic sort of way of engaging with things albeit that at the moment for example you have to be masked in so as um that will that subject of review depending on what happens over the next six months probably okay well it's really nice to see you and meet you both nina and joanna like i said feel free to drop me a line if you've got more questions and uh, i look forward to seeing an application from you if that happens okay thanks laura thanks everybody take care right. see you later Bye. bye